Psalm 67. Psalm 67. So Mike let me know a couple of weeks ago that he and his family were going to be gone for the Thanksgiving holiday and that this would be an opportunity for me to teach. And I began to think about what I would want to what I would want to teach, what direction I would want to go. And I thought, well, it's right after Thanksgiving, so I can just sort of ride the coattails of Thanksgiving and some sort of message about just the, you know, the, the wonderful uh, sort of thankful heart that we had and just sort of just, just something soft and warm and satisfying, just like Thanksgiving dinner. Or I could have... I could have jumped all over Christmas. First chance, kick off the season, steal the thunder, give out a Christmas message right now. Or I could just come down and nail everyone who went Black Christmas or Black Friday shopping, right? I could just, you're worldly and you're, no, no. Or I thought, you know, I could just come just completely, just something way out of left field. Well, (laughs) I decided, well, you know what I decided. I decided to come out of left field. I decided to do something a little bit different. The blessed blessedness of blessings. It's this sort of idea that, that we have, unfortunately, that we've created within Christian culture, especially here in America, that I really wanted to get into. We, we've sort of fantasized this idea, if you will. In fact, there are so many resources available to us, books that we can buy, videos that we can buy, sermons that we can listen to about how to be blessed, how to be made happy, and, and they're so wonderful, and they're so happy, and it's just the whole idea of blessings is just rainbows and unicorns. But the reason that I decided to go this direction, I was actually, I was writing a letter as an email, and it was kind of an intense, kind of a heavy letter that I had to write. And I finished the letter, and I signed it the way I signed most of my letters. I just said, blessings, or usually be blessed. Jeremiah, hit send. Done. But it struck me as I clicked on the send button there, the Holy Spirit sort of clicked in my ear. (laughs) said, hey, what are you doing? And for just a moment, for just a moment, I thought I considered, what did I just say? Blessings. What did I just mean? What what was my intention behind that? Because I just said it so nonchalantly, so just flippantly. and And that's, unfortunately, that's what I do with this whole idea, with this whole term of blessing, at least in my own life, I don't know about you guys, but in my own life, I have this very just surfacey, superficial idea, understanding of what it means to be blessed and what a blessing is. And I throw it around, I use it so nonchalantly, the word blessing has suddenly become so much like the word love in our culture. And we throw that word around like crazy. We, we use it and we overuse it. I love my wife. I love burritos. R- right? There's something there's something yeah. There's something wrong there. And we say, "Oh, bless you or oh, God bless me" or we have this whole terminology, this unfortunately this this fanciful sort of fruity sort of unrealistic idea of blessings and what they are. And so I began to think about that more. I began to really, for my own self, for my own, for my own edification, I began to really sort of research, redefine, to go back and refresh myself on what this means to be blessed or what this whole sort of doctrine of blessing is. And, and now this is not, I can no way be exhaust, exhaustive on one Sunday morning. So I'm not going to give you every single scripture in the Bible about blessing, but we're going to, we're going to look at it, define it. We're going to actually pick it apart, see what it is, what this whole idea really means to us. And unfortunately, most of it is not going to be rainbows and unicorns. Psalm 67. Psalm 67, verse 1. A beautiful psalm, verse 1. God be merciful to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us that your way may be known on earth 
your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you shall judge the people righteously and govern the nations on earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Then the earth shall yield her increase. God, our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear or respect him. When I read through this psalm about blessing, about God's blessing, it struck me how powerful a blessing is. How far-reaching God's blessing can be. This whole psalm, this song of worship of praise to God, is all about how God's blessing is effectual around the whole world for all time. And it struck me, maybe, perhaps, I'm taking this idea of blessing a little too lightly. If this is what God's blessing can do, and yet that's what I am continually begging for and asking for. I'm getting it wrong somehow. Because if God's blessing is so powerful and so far-reaching to the ends of the earth, it says in verse 7, then how come yesterday's blessings were not sufficient for my today? Something's wrong with my perspective, with my definition. The definition, let's talk about that for just a second. The definition of blessed, blessed. In the Bible, translated very simply, it means, oh, how happy. That's what it means. So, blessed are you, so on and so forth. In other words, oh, how happy are you? Oh, how happy. If blessing, the definition of it, the meaning of it, is happiness, the product of it is happiness, then what makes me happy? And is that the problem? Because if my happiness, if my, if my definition of blessedness is what makes me happy, perhaps that's why I'm never truly happy. Perhaps that's why I'm continually asking for more blessing. Because I've equated this blessing or this happiness with things that make me happy in the here and now, in the temporal. There's an interesting, an interesting thought about blessing. We are already in Psalms. Go forward a few to Psalm 103. As we look at this definition of blessed blessings. Psalm 103. The Psalms are great, great Psalms that teach us so much about worship and life, praise. As you're turning there, as you're getting there, let's discuss another idea that, that the Bible calls us, commands us to. Frequently in the Old Testament, we are commanded, you and I are commanded to bless the Lord. We're commanded to bless God. We are told, we are encouraged, we are called to make God happy. Oh boy. Oh boy. How does that happen? Because if blessing, if I equate my happiness with these material goods or temporal things, but then I'm supposed to make God happy, I am supposed to bless God, what thing could I buy create, make with my own hands that God needs. Does God need my stuff? Does God need our Black Friday? God doesn't need that stuff. But over and over again, we're commanded to bless the Lord. Well, what do I have to do to bless God? Well, it's very interesting. When you read the Old Testament, if you, if you, if you look at all that, that term and where it shows up and what, what it's about... Every time you see that term, that call, that command to bless the Lord, it's always linked, associated with one idea. Worship. It's always associated with worship. Okay? Worship. 
how do I do that? What do I have to do to worship and bless God? Because we get hung up on that, quite frankly. There's a lot of different churches that'll tell you that God is only pleased with one kind of worship, their kind of worship. But it's troubling. Because if you look at how the Old Testament, how people worshiped and how they blessed God, you see very different pictures. In Chronicles, David gathers the whole assembly before him. And the whole assembly is there, and David says, Now bless the Lord and praise him. And what they do is they fall on their knees, and they lay prostrate before God as they worship him. On their faces, on the ground. Okay? So, if worship for us is to be prostrate and on the ground before him, how do we accomplish that? How do we... I mean, do we pull the chairs out of here? We got to buy a bunch of rugs now? I don't know. And it gets even more confusing because then a few books forward in the book of Nehemiah, when the people gather together and they begin to praise and worship God and thank him for the work that he's doing in and through Nehemiah to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, they come together and what happens is the priests, the priests go out and they gather the people together and the priests say, bless the Lord, stand and worship him, stand and praise him. Wait a minute. Bless the Lord, and they're down on their faces worshiping. Bless the Lord, and they're standing and worshiping. It's a little bit confusing. Psalm 103, just the first couple of verses there. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not his benefits. Worship, it's not about how you do it. It's about where it comes from. It's about where it comes from. Let's look at that. In verse 1, all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. It doesn't say, bless the Lord, my lips. Even though praise, even though worship is supposed to pass over our lips, ultimately not supposed to come from our lips specifically. In other words, this whole idea of lip service during worship, you're wasting time. It doesn't say, bless the Lord, O my hands, as I raise them up or as I keep them down by my sides. It doesn't say, bless the Lord, O my legs, as I stand up, or bless the Lord, O my buns, as I sit on them doesn't say that bless the lord oh my soul and that we now we begin to see that blessing comes from within blessing if we're going to bless the lord it has to be from the heart and that's hard for us to get that's hard for us to think of because you see we think of things on such an earthly plane And we think, if I'm going to bless someone, if I'm going to bless, let's say, my kids, how am I going to bless my kids? Well, what am I going to do for them? Or what am I going to buy them? What am I going to get them? Thinking about Christmas, what am I going to get them that's going to bless them? We've already discussed this idea. God doesn't need our stuff. Well, then, I mean, how do I bless my spouse? How do I bless my spouse? Well, it's in the things that I do or the things that I say or the things I stop saying or stop doing. (laughs) Right? Maybe it's in maybe it's in just as a as a husband, maybe it's in walking up and taking that honeydew list off the fridge. And so now I have a list of things that I can do, a list that I can check off, things that I can accomplish to make her happy. And the more things I do, the happier or more blessed she becomes. But it's not about what I do. That's what this is saying. It's about where it comes from. My soul, from within. It's about not forgetting, it's about remembering Him, focusing on Him and who He is, not about what I can do. That's how we bless the Lord. And so suddenly, this entire idea of blessing 
comes a little bit more into focus now, just from, just from our look into how to bless the Lord and what it means to bless the Lord. Suddenly, it's not about what we do. It's not about how we do it. It's about, it's about worship. It's about praising our God from our hearts. You know, you want to make me happy? Get me a present. Bake me something. I don't know. You want to make God happy? Well, you give him your heart. That blesses God. It's not about how well you sing. It's about the well from which you sing. Get it? When we talk about blessings, you look through the Bible for blessings and and where you can pick it out and where you can learn from the Bible. There's three areas that we can get this idea of blessing from. You see, there's blessings that occur in the Bible before Jesus. There's blessings that occur in the Bible with Jesus. And then there's blessings that occur in the Bible because of Jesus. Before Jesus. Turn with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 32. We're going to be doing a little bit of skipping around, so I hope your fingers are warm and ready. Genesis chapter 32. While you're turning there, I'll give you the story, the setup. It's about Jacob. Jacob, his name means heel catcher, supplanter, shifty guy, (laughs) car salesman, right? No offense. That's what his name means, heel catcher, supplanter. In other words, he is just going to, he's about doing whatever he's got to do to get, to get what he needs to get at the expense of others. He was named that, you see, he actually was a twin. He was named that, his twin brother was named Esau, which basically just means red or ruddy, because Esau, Esau's a big dude. Esau was hairy, lots of red, reddish brown hair. So when they were born, Esau is born, oh boy, little wolf baby, you know. But guess what? As he is born, little baby Jacob's hand is out on Esau's foot on his heel. Hence the name heel catcher. It's almost as if, it's almost as if Jacob was just like, no, you get back in here. I want to be first, right? Jacob and Esau. Esau was born first. Now, Jacob, his, his life truly reflected his name. There was a time when they were both grown. Esau would become a burly, strapping, sort of just get to work, get it done, out in the field kind of a guy. Jacob, Jacob was different. Jacob was, I don't know if you, I've been normal, simple, easygoing kind of guy. But Jacob, to see the difference between Jacob and Esau, Esau, again, out in the field, working hard. Jacob was more the administrator type. Jacob worked in the office. And Jacob, Jacob was great about shouting the orders and organizing and administrating things from his desk, if you will. And so they were very different. And so if there wasn't enmity between them just in their birth, there certainly was in the way that they carried out their daily lives and their jobs. And so one day, Esau is out hunting. And it's getting late. And the hunt is unsuccessful. As we all know, that can be sometimes. The hunt is unsuccessful. So Esau comes down from the mountains and he's starving and it's dark and it's cold outside. And he comes home and here's Jacob. And Jacob has this pot of stew going. And Jacob's cooking it. And Esau, coming in hungry and cold and tired, says, Oh, Jacob, let me have a bowl of that stew. And Jacob, being somewhat of a conniver, looks at the stew, looks at his brother and says, I'll sell you a bowl of stew. I'll sell it to you. And it's delicious stew. You want this stew. Esau, what are you talking about? Give me the stew. Jacob says, all right, I'll let you have the stew if you give me your birthright. The birthright. The birthright. Who was born first? Esau. Therefore, Esau was the first son. Therefore, in that culture, once their father, Isaac, died, that means everything would go to Esau. Jacob seeing an opportunity, says, you can have my bowl of stew if I can have 
your birthright. Esau, thinking this guy's nuts, crazy, whatever, sure, it's all yours, buddy. Now give me the stew. <laughs> Gives it over to him. Years would go by, and it came the day for Isaac to pronounce the blessing. Isaac was getting old, and he knew it, and Isaac believed that his days were numbered. He was already blind, and he figured, I'm going to die soon. I might as well pronounce the blessing, get this over with, and give everything over to Esau. So he calls Esau and says, hey, we're going to do this. Uh, We're going to make this, uh, we're going to have fun with this. But first, uh, what I'd like you to do, Esau, son, I'd like you to go hunting and Man, before I give you the blessing, could you please cook me a venison dinner, a roast? Get me that back strap and and roll that in peppercorns and salt and marinade and rub that and grill that. And that's what I want, Esau. Esau, yeah, sure, Dad. So Esau gets his stuff. He goes hunting. Well, while he goes hunting, Jacob and his mother take that opportunity to sneak in and get what's not his. They kill a goat. They kill that goat. They begin to cook the goat. They skin the goat. They put the skin of the goat. They drape it over his arms. Jacob then walks into Isaac's tent, blind Isaac, walks into his tent with a big goat roast in his hands. Dad, supper's ready. Are you Esau? You don't sound like Esau. Oh, I'm Esau. Smell the food. Feel my hairy arms. Isaac says, oh, okay. And so Isaac gives him the blessing, pronounces the blessing to him. Esau shows up with a roast, (laughs) comes into the tent. I'm already, Dad. What are you talking about? The whole thing comes out. And Esau is broken, weeping, begging Isaac, please undo it. Please give me the blessing. Just, Just give it to me. And Isaac says, I can't. Whoa. So right there in that story, right there, I see automatically there's something sacred about a blessing. There's something about a blessing that can't just be given and taken back and it's not a yo-yo or a boomerang. There's something sacred about a blessing. And so Esau, enraged, says, I'm going to kill Jacob. (laughs) Jacob takes off. Jacob takes off, and for years he's gone. He came back for one thing, but it was only very short. He, he, He left again. He was afraid that Esau was going to kill him. Jacob takes off, and Jacob would spend more years of his life being sort of a shifty dude, kind of a conniver, and kind of uh, you know, living his lifestyle. And, and at times the tables would be turned on him. But we get to a point now in our story where Jacob, he now has two wives, two female servants, and 11 kids. But Jacob feels that he needs to reconcile with Esau. He needs to go back home. It's been a long time. So Jacob takes his whole family, and they start to travel back home. And on this journey, on this journey, they stop to make camp, and that's where we pick up in verse 22. Chapter 32, verse 22. He arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the fort of Jacob. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. So on their journey, they stopped to make camp for the night, and Jacob, feeling like he needs some alone time, sends his family on in front of him. Now, I get it. He's got eleven kids. He wants some peace and quiet right? (laughs) Two wives, yeah, he's ready to go. Okay, you guys go over there. I'm going to sleep over here. For some reason, Jacob wanted to be alone that night. So Jacob pitches his tent. He's out there. He's by himself. And a stranger walks up. And suddenly there's a wrestling match. (laughs) What? Yeah, kind of strange. I mean, who goes camping and then ends up wrestling, fighting with a perfect stranger. But don't tell me. Don't tell I don't want to know. What, whatever you do on your camping trips. So they wrestle. Verse 25. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, that is the man prevail against Jacob, 
he touched the socket of his, Jacob's, hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, the man said, let me go for the day breaks. But he, Jacob, said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face. My life is preserved. Did you notice in verse 24, man was capitalized? Did you see that? Not because he's just a big dude. Jacob clarifies for us. He clarifies for us there at the end of our section. He says, I've seen God face to face. This man was God in flesh. God in flesh. Does that sound familiar? Who does that remind you of? Jesus. Jesus. What? Okay, wait a minute. All right. This is called, in Scripture, this is called a Christophany or a Theophany. An appearance of Christ or an appearance of God before his birth in Bethlehem. Now, this might sound weird, might sound strange, unbelievable. Just think of it as this for a moment. If God really is God, big, great creator God, is it hard for him to show up on earth as a man? No. No. So God, Christ, shows up at Jacob's camp, and I wish that they had recorded what they said to each other. What did Jesus say to Jacob to start a fight? Like, I wish I knew how that went. How did he get him riled up? Somehow, they end up start wrestling. And they wrestled all night long. So long that dawn is coming. And Jesus says to him, let go. It's time for the sun to come. Let go. The day is breaking. Now, we may struggle with that a little bit and, and consider, well, if, if he's God, how is it that he didn't just beat Jacob so easily? Like, why is this, why, how come they wrestled all night long? Like, if he's, if he's really God and he's, you know, God's so great and mighty and powerful, and how come? I think of it like this. I'm father of four little boys. I have ample opportunity to wrestle in my house, right? <laughs> my living room very frequently turns into the caged octagon, if you know what I mean. I mean, it just gets nuts in there sometimes. WrestleMania on my living room carpet. And it's fun because all of my boys are different, so I know they're going to come at me in different ways. My seven-year-old, he's very cautious, very cunning, though, very smart kid. So he feels like the best way for him to take me down is from behind, where I'm not expecting. So I know that as we're wrestling, I'm going to get jumped on by my seven-year-old. He's going to come at me from behind, his arms around my neck. My four-year-old, well, he's very different. You see, he doesn't wrestle for the fisticuffs of the whole thing. He wrestles because he loves cuddles. So what he'll do is he'll run up, but as soon as he hits me, he just goes, just kind of limp, you know what I mean? And he's just like, hold me, shake me, you know, tickle me, and he just loves that. He's just a rag doll, you know? My two-year-old, my two-year-old is insane. Uh, no, <laughs> my two-year-old, though, Caution is to the wind. He has no care. He has no regard for his personal safety. And he will run and just launch himself at me. Doesn't matter where his head is going. Doesn't matter where his body is going to land. None of that. He just comes full bore at me. And even my eight-month-old baby son, he if he's on the floor witnessing all of this, he is ecstatic. He loves it. And so there's nothing better to him if I just reach my arm over and just kind of give him the once-over with my hand, right? But here's what happens when I wrestle my children. Sometimes when I wrestle my boys, sometimes they win. Now, is that because I can't beat my seven-year-old? No. 
Is that because I can't beat my rag doll of a four-year-old? No. Is it because I can't beat my two-year-old? Well, again, he's a little crazy, you know. He's kind of like the soap and the bar of soap and the sock kind of crazy, you know, like he, maybe. <laughs> I got to watch him. But no, is it because I can't beat my eight-month-old baby? No, it's because I'm wrestling with them and sometimes they win because I'm teaching them things. Sometimes it's because I want to toughen them up a little bit in a gentle way. Sometimes it's because I want to build their confidence. Sometimes it's because I just love them. I want to expend some of their energy. Sometimes they win. There's always a purpose, a reason, meaning behind it. Things that they learn. So Jesus, God in the flesh, wrestles with Jacob. And he's taken Jacob to the limit. But Jacob, true to his name, did not quit and would not let go until he got what he wanted. The blessing. Bless me. I will not let go until you bless me. And so what did Jesus do? What did God do? How did he bless him? He did two things. He changed his name. He changed his name. But he also touched him. That's how powerful he was. That's how strong he was. He just touched Jacob's hip. And when he touched Jacob's hip, the whole thing went out of joint. And Jacob was crippled from that point on. He crippled him. That, that is the blessing. Some blessing, <laughs> right? He crippled him. And he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And he summed up Jacob's life in one very perfect sentence. He said, You have struggled with God and with men. In other words, Jacob, your entire life has been fighting and struggling and conniving and doing whatever you had to do at the expense of other people to get what you wanted. You've been struggling, wrestling your whole life with people and with me. But now your name is Israel. And Israel means governed by God. Governed by God. Jacob was crippled now. Jacob was disabled now. There was no way that Jacob could do it on his own anymore. There was no way that Jacob was strong enough to do it by himself. He would need help in a very real way. He would need help. He would need the cane. He would need God's help from that point on. And truly his name was governed by God. And that was the blessing the blessing to Jacob came in the brokenness. The blessing was in the brokenness. And that flies in the face of what we want and what we like to call a blessing. I don't want to be broken. Oh, but the blessing is in the brokenness. I'm going to change. I'm going to break who you were, God said. And I'm going to make you into someone new. Someone who relies upon me, depends upon me. And now the blessing in that is that Jacob no longer has to figure his way out of things. He no longer has to think up his own plans. He no longer has to worry about how he's going to do this or how he's going to do that or come up with his own schemes for things anymore. That burden is gone. And now God governs him. God will direct him. God will figure it out. That's the idea there. That's the point there. And what would happen, you see, immediately after this, you see, Jacob had been sending forward, in front of him and his traveling party, he was sending forward to Esau groups. Groups of livestock, groups of oxen, treasures. He was sending gifts ahead of himself to meet Esau. You see, he realized, what I stole from Esau, what I stole from Esau was the blessing. I stole all the stuff. And so what I want to do, if I'm going to make amends with Esau, if he's going to not kill me, is I have to send all this stuff ahead. I've got to repay him with interest. And maybe by the time I get to him, he'll have all my stuff and he'll have forgiven me. 
And he, so he sends all of his stuff forward. But what happens is the people would show up to Esau with donkeys and with, with, with camels and with livestock and with servants and all that. And they would say, we are from Jacob. We're now yours, Esau. And so Esau, how he responded was Esau got together 400 of his men. And Esau went out to ride to meet Jacob. Esau wasn't going to sit around and wait for Jacob to come to him. Esau decided to go after Jacob. And Jacob hears this, understands this, and so Jacob keeps sending people forward. And what happens is Esau finally makes it to Jacob, and he doesn't kill him. He doesn't shout him out or bawl him out. Instead, what Esau does, Esau embraces him, and he grabs him close, and he hugs him, and he kisses him on his neck, and he restores him. And it wasn't because of the stuff. Esau said, I don't want the stuff. I want you, my brother. And so Jacob learns now, it's not about me figuring this out, me trying to, well, if I do this and I give him that, and I think if I give him that and I give him that, and if I give him all the stuff, maybe then he'll receive me. It's not about the stuff. The blessing never was about the stuff. It never was. It's not about the stuff with God. I can't, there's no stuff that I can give God. It's not about the stuff here on earth. It's not about, the blessing's not in the stuff. And we have a hard time with that. In our culture, we have a hard time with that because we are so, by nature, (laughs) we're so dissatisfied and discontent. And our culture feeds that. I mean, think about it. I have a little Toyota pickup little toyota tacoma a 2001 it is base model power nothing i practically have to pedal the engine myself right very stripped down vehicle but do you know what toyota did in 2002 they made the exact same truck but better and then in 2003 they made the exact same truck, but better. And 2004, and so on and so forth. But really, what was wrong with last year's model that they had to get their entire design team, hire all their engineers, clear the tables, redraw, reconfigure, redesign to make the new model? Nothing's wrong with it. They did it because you want it. Because you know you need it. You think you need it. I mean, think about it. (laughs) If someone's selling you a product that they have to remake every single year, (laughs) is it really worth buying that product? Well, this house will be good for one year. (laughs) Then you'll need a new one. Oh, (laughs) I don't know about that. And yet think about our cell phones. Our cell phones aren't even designed to last as long as our contracts are, right? We live in a culture that feeds on our discontent, that feeds on our dissatisfaction with what we already have. And unfortunately, that drives, you think about it, that drives our economy, that drives our retail industry. It's selling us stuff we think we need because it's the latest, the greatest, the newest version. Because we believe, we've been fooled into believing that last year's model is not going to cut it for us. But unfortunately, we take that and we apply it then to our Christian lives. And what we're saying then is, God, last year's blessings, yesterday's blessings, they don't, they're not as good as today's blessings, God. And then we begin to pray for God's blessings and we're saying, God bless my finances. But in the back of our head, we're saying 500, maybe 550, 600, Lord. God bless my children. But what we're really saying is, God, make them obedient and make them just be quiet and sit down. God bless my marriage. God, just fix her. (laughs) Or him, usually him. But what we're saying when we, when we really do these things is we're saying that, God, what you blessed me with yesterday is not sufficient for today, and I need a whole new slew of blessings. Now, the Bible says his mercies are new every morning, but that's his mercies toward us. 
not his blessings. His blessings, his blessings don't expire. And in, in that sense, even his mercy doesn't expire either if it's fresh and available for us every day. So don't misinterpret that. Jacob, in this idea of blessings, this was before Christ. This was before Jesus. If we go forward to the book of Matthew, turn, if you will, to Matthew chapter 5. We look at this idea now of blessings with Jesus. That is, we study from the Bible what it means to be blessed while Jesus was walking amongst us blessings with Jesus. And Jesus defined blessings for us in a very powerful and poignant way in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, this section of scriptures is called the Beatitudes. And what this is, is this is Jesus' very first public teaching that has been recorded for all of history. And this is significant because this is the first time that God speaks publicly on record for all of history, since Malachi. The last book of the Old Testament was the last time there was any prophetic scriptural utterance from God that was recorded for retention. The distance, the time from Malachi until this time in Jesus' day is 400 years. So this is God now standing up in front of man after 400 years of silence speaking, teaching, and the first thing he teaches about is blessings. Let's read it. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. Seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. I don't know, I don't think I want those blessings. Right? When we think about it, think about, think about a child going to bed saying his bedtime prayers. God, bless dad and bless mom. God, make my dad poor in spirit and make my mom mourn. <laughs> what? Jesus, Jesus defines blessings. We know that blessings aren't in the material things now. We've been over that. We saw that in, in the Psalms in blessing God. We saw that in Jacob's life. The blessings are not about the material things. The blessings, what Jesus is saying here, the blessings continue to be in the brokenness. Look at the state of all of these people who are blessed these are m- m- most of the, 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 the situations, the circumstances of these people are not things that we would want or wish for ourselves. The poor in spirit, mourning, the meek. Americans don't like meek. Meekness is strength under control. It's taking your foot off the gas pedal of your 350 big block whatever. That's not the American way. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, not for entertainment, not for humor, not for money or food. The merciful. We love to receive mercy, but I have a hard time giving mercy. The pure in heart, that speaks completely of character. Something in this day and age that is lost on so many of us. Blessed are the peacemakers. Could you imagine if Facebook was filled with more peacemakers than opinion makers? Those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For the sake of righteousness, not the sake of your politics. (laughs) 
Blessed when you when they revile you and persecute you and speak all kinds of evil against you. I don't like to be reviled, persecuted, or spoke spoken evil of. Even for his name's sake, I have a hard time with that. But Jesus says, it is in that brokenness that you receive the blessing. But what is the blessing? Think about this. Let's look through this real quick. The poor in spirit, they get the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn, they get comforted by God. The meek inherit the earth. The, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled with what? Righteousness. Those who are merciful will be given mercy. Those who are impure in heart or of good character will see God. The peacemakers will be called the sons of God. Those who are persecuted, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The blessing in all of this brokenness is not for the here and now. Did you notice that? In every sense here, the blessing, the blessing is not just for the here and now. The blessing is for now through eternity. The kingdom, God. It's like, it's like this. Driving around Emmett, southern Idaho, a couple things you'll see lots of are fields and fences, right? Well, I like to think of life like one of those field fences. Life goes on, sometimes further than we can see. That fence just runs past over the horizon. But our time here on earth is but one post in that fence. <laughs> no, our time here on earth is one barb on that wire. It is that small in comparison to the length, to the etern eternality of what life is. And what Jesus is saying here is Jesus is saying your brokenness for this time for this short time on earth, is for the purpose of blessing for your en entire eternity. Blessings are not just for the here and now. Blessings are for your life forever. And I realize, and I think about that, and I realize, man, I've been getting the whole thing wrong. I've been thinking that blessing is just about this stuff, and it's about what makes me happy right now, and it's not about the stuff it's about the heart. It's about the brokenness. And it's not just for what, it's not just for my problems today. It's for my spiritual well being for forever. I've been getting it so wrong. Quite frankly, when I equate my blessings to the things that I think I need or I want today, then I've cheapened the whole idea of it. I've turned it into some sort of a fantasy some sort of a unicorn and rainbows idea about being happy. And Jesus is saying, change your perspective. Broaden it. Look down that fence and think about the things that you will need. Think about the blessings that you will be given that will carry you down the rest of that fence for the rest of your eternity. blessings with Jesus. And then there are blessings because of Jesus. When we look in the Bible, go forward to Ephesians and we'll wrap it up. Go forward to Ephesians chapter 1. Jesus didn't remain here on earth. In fact, he very vividly showed us, showed hundreds of witnesses that he was leaving earth physically to dwell in heaven. He did so through his ascension, right? Now, I don't know exactly what it looked like, and the Bible tells us, but it doesn't give an, an incredible description, but somehow, whether he sort of floated or maybe he started kind of climbing an invisible stairway or ladder, or I have no idea what, but Jesus all of a sudden is ascending. 
up into the clouds. And this is so amazing, so crazy, that the whole group that was gathered around him, they're staring at him as he goes up into the clouds, as he disappears, and they're just looking there. And God actually sends a couple angels, and these angels walk up to the crowd, and they kind of look, and what are you guys looking at? (laughs) Jesus is flying, right? (laughs) And the angels, basically, the angels tell them, get your heads out of the cloud. Get your heads out of the cloud. Jesus had to leave. He had to go. And you see, remember, Jesus said something. Before he ascended, he said something. He promised something. He said, I'm going to go, but I'm going to send you a helper. Jesus called him a teacher, the Holy Spirit. And when you read the book of Acts right after the ascension, what happens as the believers gather and as they pray, as they sing and praise and bless God, as they pray, the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And what happens now for believers, for you and I, as we receive and, and as, we, as we accept, receive, and, and, and take salvation, receive Jesus Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit as well. So that God no longer shows up on earth every now and then, like he did in the Old Testament. He no longer dwells with us in physical form, like he did when Jesus walked the earth. But now, God dwells within us by his Spirit to every believer. And what that means is very important to what Paul has to say about blessings. In verse 1, Ephesians chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Now you read through that one time over and it sort of looks like the blessed blessedness of blessings, right? <laughs> but if we pick that apart, if we look at it, here's what happens and, that, and hold on tight and, and remember what all that we've been speaking about. Blessed, or oh how happy, is God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is blessed. How? Who has blessed us? with every spiritual blessing. God blessed us, and that blessed him. See that? God God made us happy, has given us happiness, has blessed us, and that blessed him. With what? With every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. God has given us, has blessed us with everything that we need for our eternity. He's already given it to us, and it made him so happy to give that to us. And how did he do that? In Christ. In Christ. So it's no longer about what I have to do to earn a blessing or what I have to, how I have to ask or how I have to sing it or how I have to write it or how I have to pray it. It's no longer about the things that I've got to do. It's no longer about the temporal here and now stuff. But God has given us blessing, every spiritual blessing. We don't have to earn them. We don't have to try to attain them. With Christ, the whole slew of blessings are there. Paul says, Elsewhere in Galatians, he says, you know, it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ that lives within me. And in Christ are every spiritual blessing you will ever need for eternity. And that blessed God. That blessed God. So what does this mean to us? Does this mean I need to stop saying God bless you? (laughs) Does this mean I need to stop asking for blessing? No, absolutely not. All that it does is it changes your perspective of what you're asking for, what you're giving to others. That's all that it does. 
When you say, God, please bless my marriage, suddenly you're not just shouting out to an angry God who is upset with how you've been living, with how you've been treating her or him. Realize now, you're asking a happy God who is pleased by Jesus Christ and says to you, I've given you everything you need for a healthy marriage. I've given you everything. Would you be the wife that I've called you to be? Would you be the husband that I've called you to be? I've given you that blessing. It's there in his word. The same with our children. God, how do I bless my kids? Help me be a good parent. I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. God is happy. He's not waiting to flick you off the face of the earth now for the things that you've done. Jesus Christ covered that and that made him happy. And now he is blessed to have given you access to everything. And so when we ask for blessings, realize that what you're asking for is you're saying, God, help me to receive that. Help me to receive, to understand. Make your scriptures clear to me, Lord. Give me encouragement from others so that I can be the person that you've called me to be, that you've enabled me to be. By your grace, God. And when we bless others, it's no longer longer just a fanciful, fruity little way of saying goodbye or hello. But when we bless others, we can honestly say, I hope that you are blessed by God for eternity. I hope that God gives you everything that you need to live and love him. And he has. Again, it's not to stop us from saying it. In fact, we ought to say it more. (laughs) But it's the perspective, it's the heart, it's from where we say it. We're going to pray, we're going to worship. Communion is available at the front encourage you to, if you're a believer in Christ, come on down and get it. Take it back to your seats and we'll take it together. But for right now, as we worship, realize if you choose to worship from your heart right now, you'll bless God. Happiness on top of happiness. Is that incredible? Let's pray.